Hello. Hello. So exciting to have it. Thank you very much. I have a, my, my brand here, but I'm going to change the slides because it makes me a little bit self-conscious. Uh, so we'll start with the, the title of this talk, which is Finding Purpose and Cultivating Spirituality. And I want to start with something, uh, with a statement. So while society or others, right, tell you to obsess about work and wanting more, I think I belong to a crazy collective, um, and maybe you'll join me, that believe that you have to obsess about self-awareness, about mental health, about deep connections with others, about sustained happiness and joy. And that's what I call self-mastery skills. And that's what we're going to talk about today. How do we gain these mastery skills? So I'm going to, take, uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about, uh, a little bit about me. I, uh, I think I was introduced. I'm Andrea Gwendelman. I am a tech founder. I am a former lawyer. I am an immigrant. Uh, I am a mom. I'm, I am Latina. I'm Jewish. And why does it, why does it matter? Why does this description matter? Because it has affected um, how I, I have gone in and found the spiritual journey. Because all these things that have immigrated from one country to another, things, everything that, that went on in my life, all these adventures, all these challenges, and in general, all of us that are ambitious are going to basically face deep, deep challenges. And it is with the spiritual tools or an abund okay, or we can call it an abundance mindset or the skills that, we, that we're going to discuss that we can access life's creative agency and greet and claim life as our own and design our own path that will be different from anyone else. And that's, those are the spiritual tools and the, masters, the, the mastery tools that I want to discuss today. And I'm gonna, before that, I want to tell a little bit about myself. So I left, uh, I was actually, I was born in the US, but I was raised in Chile. And I left when I was 25. I came to the United States. Uh, I went to Harvard Law School, which was kind of amazing. Uh, and after that, I went to practice law in a New York law firm, the Boys and Plimpton, one of the biggest, best New York law firms. And then I went to work at the federal, in the federal government in a very prestigious federal agency. And I, while I was doing this career, I was always feeling inside that I was heavily repressing something and I didn't know what it was. But I knew that there was something from my childhood. As I remember the creativity and the passion I felt when I was younger that I did not feel anymore. And it was kind of like incredible to remember. And so at some point of the soul searching, I left my career as a lawyer in my, in my early 40s, actually my late 30s. I quit after years of therapy, by the way, because it takes a while to quit a legal career. But basically I quit and I started soul searching and I really did not quit with a plan. I had no plan. I only knew I wanted to do something creative. So I went to art school for like a semester. I studied film. I went to editing. I mean, I had no idea until I found myself creating a huge entrepreneurship event in Chile. It was called Common Pitch Chile. We brought Al Gore, Devendra Banhart, the vodka, whatever. It was an incredible success. I raised tons of money. And I realized, ah, I'm an entrepreneur. But one thing is working for somebody else, creating a, an event that was very successful. And the other thing is risking your own capital, your own time. But anyway, I went and I created a tech company after that, uh, even though I wasn't from tech, I was a lawyer basically, but I was so inspired. It was so basically aligned. I got the funding, I got the co-founders, I got press, it was amazing. But then there was starting to, we started to have setbacks because that's reality, you know, like I, there were like setbacks. A lot of setbacks, one after the other, and it started. And basically, that's when fear came in. I was crippled with fear, with anxiety, fear of the competition, fear of losing everything I have done. And people have called me crazy for me, leaving my, my career and 
investing all this time and all this money and getting investment, I, I, need, I couldn't fail, right? I mean, it was so, 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 it was so stressful. So I, um, in, that, in, that, in that moment when you're like at that level of anxiety and fear, willpower and keep going are definitely not enough. I was depleted, I had no motivation, and worst of all, I think I was full of limiting beliefs. So finding the spiritual tools that allowed me to connect deeper with myself, access energy, have, um, not, not take things personally, distinguish between uh, being a victim and being an owner, and in general, have more uh, joyfulness and happiness, are things that I want for everybody here. Because I think anyone, no matter how old you are, what race you are, ethnicity you are, gender you are, and whatever circumstance in life, you can live your fullest potential and live life in your own terms. And so here I am today, a tech entrepreneur. I'm in my third startup right now. So my first startup, this, this have all been evolutions, right? So I, you could say that I have failed twice. No, well, not really, but the first time you could have said I failed, but it was an evolution to, to for where I started, I created a social media network for Latinos that really didn't have a business model. And the, the reality was companies, this was 2015, and companies had no interest in diversity and inclusion. So there was like, you had to, basically when you talked about like diverse candidates, candidates from diverse backgrounds, everyone thought that these were remedial candidates. And it was so infuriating, it was so exhausting. But anyway, that transition to wall breakers with a new partner, we created a new model, but it was still hard to convince companies in 2018, 2019, and even in the early 2020 that this was an important thing, that you wanted talent like that. It wasn't a remedial. You weren't being nice. You needed them, right? And then in two, is at the end of 2020 and 2021, wall breakers exploded. We got huge clients and now has become speak. And the journey keeps going, gets harder. The, the stakes are harder. These tools are what I use every day. So let me start with the, I think, the most important one. And I'm going to ask you to do a little exercise, connecting within. So I'm going to ask you, if you're OK with it, to close your eyes. Everybody to close their eyes. Settle in, close your eyes. And just imagine that you have the sun on top of your head. Bright light, bright sun shining on top of your head. And the rays of sun are coming in into your body through your head, the top of your head. You know, the, 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 they go through your nose all the way down, all the way through your body. They illuminate you all, in, all inside. They illuminate your arms, your legs, your stomach, they, they circulate this light from the sun that is coming. It's coming into you, it's like a shower of sunlight. It's amazing, it feels so warm, it feels so clear. And now try to direct your attention a little bit to the center of your heart and put that warmth light, that beautiful, beautiful shining white light rubbing your heart and you can feel your heart pulsating, and you can feel that light sort of rubbing it, kind of like soothing it. And now, once you wrapped your heart with that beautiful light, can you try to like push the light out towards, again, from where it came originally from the top, and you push it out towards the top of your head to connect to the sun and the sun sends your light back in, and you send light back out. And imagine sending, getting the light from the sun, all coming into you, and you're like actually sending it out. It's all connecting together. And when you're ready, you can start opening your eyes. Well, this is what I call the universe is you, and you are the universe. Because the universe is not something that is outside yourself. The universe is, you are part of it, 
and is inside of you. And when, so people, you've heard this expression, trust the universe. What does it mean? It means trust yourself. It means that you are connected to that, eter that light, that eternal life that comes from the universe. You are connected to it and you can give back and you receive. It's just one, one, one body of energy. And as long as you practice that and you start imagining how you flow with that, you'll understand that there's only one, one, we're all one, and we're all part of the same. So how do you achieve joy and self-realization? I argue, and many in the mindfulness community and everybody, I mean, that's what we're all, is that you have to find it inside. That's where you find joy. That's when you find wellness. That's where you find peace and happiness. So yeah, sure, I mean, People say, you know, well, I'll be happy when I get the promotion. I'll be happy when I make more money. I'll be happy when I find a boyfriend. I'll be happy when I buy that house. I'll be happy, I'll be happy when, when, when. They're all things that happen outside of you. And so, and they, yes, they, they sure, they make you happy. They make you happy for a minute. <laughs> you get the promotion, you're happy for a week. You get the new rental, you're happy for, I don't know, five days. Uh, you get the car, you're happy for maybe a month, you know? I don't know, <laughs> each one has different preferences. But eventually, the, it subsides, it goes away, and then you want something else. It was other thing that is gonna make me happy. It's not raising a million dollars, it's raising five million dollars. It's not raising five million dollars, it's raising 200 million. Whatever it is, like in your startup, you know, whatever it is. And so, the question is, are you gonna be conditioned by living life determined by whatever happens outside as if the universe and you were two different things? Or you're gonna concentrate on whatever is that you wanna feel, feeling it now. So feeling happy even before you get the promotion, feeling happy before you get the lover, <laughs> feeling happy before you get the house or whatever feeling is fulfilled. Because no one, to be honest, even if when you change jobs and you get a fantastic boss, the boss will be a jerk sometimes, and the boss will disappoint you. And that lover that was amazing for the first, how long does it last that you feel like someone is amazing and you can, like four months? Like four months, five months at the most. I mean, basically like, right? I mean, like, you're like, oh my God, what do I get into, like, right? So, and, and all these things that like, basically they're bound to disappoint you. So I think that if I had to define spirituality, is that, it's just finding joy, wellness, calm, self-confidence inside of you. Not because someone tells you that you're doing a great job and not because anything else, it's just you find it within you. That is spirituality. And so how do we go about it? How do we do that? I mean, it sounds really easy, but it's really hard to do. Well, it's hard to do because as everything that we do in life, it requires some practice and some, you know, sort of like, it's like going to a gym and there's things that you have to like do, things that you have to feel. For example, the exercise I made with the uni about the universe and the sun, I mean, if you were, you were able, if you were able to envision the sun coming in and feeling your like body with the sun and the light and the light coming out, I can tell you you're in a very good mental moment right now because even doing that exercise when you're extremely stressed or disturbed, it's hard, it's hard to connect with the universe when you're like super like, sort of like contracted, afraid. You cannot do that, like light, light doesn't come in and out. So if you were able to do it, congratulations, you are in a great mental place, by the way. And I will say that mental, emotional, and physical go kind of together. And mental is the, the, the most difficult one to achieve, right? I, that mental clarity. But basically, I think that going inside requires a little bit of inquiry. Because you have to ask yourself, what can I do to feel calm right now? Like, what can I do to feel happy right now? For example, I just got criticized by a colleague, by a colleague or a coworker. They made me feel like whatever. And so, the ability to inquire, mm, that's kind of mental chatter, like I'm feeling insecurity, does it really have to do with me? How do I separate myself from this? How do I not engage in that? How do I not react? All that is very much fueled by inquiry. And, um, and 
inquiry and two things, and the other thing, self-observation, observing yourself from the outside, like as if you were like someone else. I mean, you're like, oh, curious. It's like in inquiry, like, ah, interesting that I'm feeling this. Ah, this is, this is the way that I'm feeling interesting that I'm reacting this way. So of self-observing, self-observation and inquiry are the things that allow you really to, to go within. Um, so I'm gonna stop this with, I'm gonna stop this slide because I think we, we cover a lot here, but I think this is the most important part of, of, of really the, any spiritual practice. And I think that immediately after that comes like finding your truth and finding your voice because if you're able to connect internally, you're able to really get to know to a place where you are kind of deeply intimate with yourself, like where you are alone and you're like actually like hanging out by yourself with yourself alone. It's kind of nice, it's like sweet, it's joyful. When you're in that moment, you, there's a lot of things you know about you, about you. Like you get to know, you be friends, you become friends with yourself. And when you get to know yourself really well, you can talk your truth. Like you will be in front of other people and you'll be able to say, you know, I think you should work in that project, someone will say to you. And you'll say, actually, no, that project doesn't suit the best of my abilities. So I would like to work on this other project. Imagine, I mean, that would be amazing. We're like, no, 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 thank you, I want to work. So super like clear or, you know, uh, yeah, you, you need to do another thing now. I'm gonna ask you to, to, to take on this other assignment. And you say, no, actually, I, I need to finish this and I want to do it well. So like you, you, you learn to say no and put boundaries. You learn to say what you want to do and no one to do. You learn to be in a relationship without like sort of like codependency and expecting like because you know you don't need anything from anyone because you are, you have everything and you're with someone else because it's just a compliment, because it's fun, because it's joyful. So imagine how much improvement, improvement you will have in your relationships at work, in your relationships in, the, in your home, everything. If you were able to really be in deep connection with your truth of who you are and you were able to voice it on a regular basis, right? Imagine, that would be amazing. So let's move immediately about this, 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 this topic. We're talking about the truth. We're talking about deep connection inside. And now imagine the joy of getting super connected to your superpowers. And when I talk about superpowers, you know, when you're in the flow, you've been in the flow, that feeling of like, oh my God, there's no work. That's, that's, that's no work. There's no work when you're in the flow, right? It's all like super fun, like exciting, creative. You're like fast, fast in manifesting, right? So the superpowers, I would say, are those things that make you be on the flow. And no one can be, be in a life of uh, only work when you're exercising your superpowers. But if you're able to identify them, that is an incredible win. So what means to, to be in your zone of genius, really, it means that, or your superpowers, right? And when I call the solo, so, son of genius, is that you're, you're playing a game in which you're winning. So you're, you, you're, playing, you're playing a winning hand. You're playing to your strengths and you're like masking really your, like your, um, your weaknesses. So how do you do that? How do, you know, I was telling you, I was a lawyer for 12 years and I definitely was not playing to my strengths. Being a lawyer was you not know, playing to any of my strengths. And I always felt inadequate, always, all the time. So how do you find your zone of genius? First of all, you experiment and collect. And how you experiment and collect, and maybe some of you switch jobs, I'm not advertising for anyone. Other people like take projects, you can take projects outside your work. Or you can interview people and talk to people that have done different things. So you put yourself in different situations that allow you to like, but you're able to see which tasks really give you stress and which tasks make you be on the flow. And it's gonna be very clear where, where kind of what, who, which ones they are. And so then you build a matrix, which uh, let me put it like, I call it a skill map. And you build, you put your skills in zero to 10 from like the worst to the best, you know? And then you assign the, the ones that where you are 
you have high competency and high passion to the ones that you have low, low competency and low passion. And in between, they're going to be like, you're going to be competent even not amazing and love it. So you're gonna be, you may be bad at something and love it, or you can be good at something and don't love it. So you, 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 you grade those. And the zone of genius is really where you are excellent and you love it. And that's where you start kind of trying to gravitate in your work. That's where you start to put your energy and projects that you're going to take on. So you're going to have to do a lot of things that are in your zone of excellence, where you're very good at it, and you don't love it, but you'll have to do it because that's reality. I mean, I don't think anyone can operate in the zone of genius. I mean, if someone is operating all, all day long in the zone of genius, let me know. Anyone here that feels I, I want to meet you after this talk? OK, well, I, I, I don't, and I, but I aspire to it for sure. Um, and this is super important at work, because what you can do is you can build this matrix of like your zones of genius or excellence. Once you have them identified, you, you list all your skills, right? You list all your skills, and you grade them for, by interest and proficiency. And you can use this to go to managers, to go to your bosses, to go to others in the team and say, look, this is my son. This is what I'm really good at. Like, so give it to me and I'll take this. Like, look at the, the confidence that you would like, kind of like project because you know what you're good at. And sure, I can do that. I can help the team. I'm a team player and I'll, t I'll, take, I'll take it for the team and I'll, I'll do that. That is not in my son of genius, but I know, I know how to do it. So I'll do that. Imagine how you would come across. And how having the skills ranked for you will help you negotiate tasks in your teams with like projects that you want to take. I mean, it will be, it's not that difficult to do, um, but it requires, again, self-knowledge, going inside, getting to know yourself, going, going and, and, and doing a little bit of internal work. Um, so let's talk a little bit about managing energy. It's one of my favorite topics. I feel it's one of the most difficult things to learn how to do how to access and manage energy. Because when you are basic, I don't know if you're going to hear, but when you are managed, when you are in tune with the energy, in tune with the, the universal flow, really, you're able to manifest. Because imagine the example I gave you, where you were receiving the sun, the sunlight, and it was coming all, all over you, and you were feeling so sort of like clear and connected, right? In that moment of calmness and openness, Ideas and creativity pour in like just divinely. So it's almost like you, you start receiving downloads and downloads of information and things that you should do and then you go do them and all this is seamless and it's not that you're manifesting because you're magic. It's just because you are connected. Nothing is an effort. It's effortless. So accessing this energy, being in, in touch with this energy helps you manifest. Because you're in the flow, everything you can do is happens faster because it have, you're not, not noticing time. So these are the good things about energy. But let's talk a little bit about the bad things about energy and how you also need to manage, learn to manage energy to, to deal with them. One is, is like basically when we work in teams, when we work with others and we have partners in life that have negative energy, we absorb a lot of negative energy from other people. We absorb the the energy, the nervousness, the anxiety, and knowing how to protect yourself from that energy is part of this, this internal work and spiritual work. Super important work because otherwise you get confused and the negative energy of one person can ruin your whole week or the whole day, the whole, you know, it can ruin the whole day and then the whole week because you just receive it and you didn't know how to protect yourself. At the same time, you giving positive energy out, you radiating positive energy, can affect your whole team, your whole family, can affect the whole universe for the better. So that, that, that work of managing energy is something that is deep. I, obviously, it's not going to be covering one slide, but that's something I want to invite you to do. Um, I'm going to go directly into this dealing with fear, resistance, and criticism. But first, I want you to like take a two minutes to think about fears, a fear that you have right now. I'll give you a minute. Something that you, re that you have, a, or anxiety, something that is giving you fear and anxiety, or fear. Let, let's, 
any of those two things, doesn't matter. Just think about whatever it is, one thing. Could be something in your house, could be something at work, something you are dreading this week. It would, today you woke up with like a feeling in your stomach, I don't want to go to a meeting with these people, I can't stand them. Um, I cannot really like talk to my partner about what I feel, he's going to get mad, whatever it is, right? Go and can you just feel it in your body? Where is it? Is it in your like chest? Is it in your stomach? Is it in your, I don't say in your jaws? Where is the feeling of the, the, that kind of negative thing that is happening? And so once you identify where in your body it is, just touch it or put your hands wherever it is in your stomach. If like you're feeling this anxiety about like, tomorrow, you have to, this deadline, whatever it is, right? And then just acknowledge it. Acknowledge the fear that you have or the anxiety that you have. Like, yes, I'm having fear about this. Yes, actually, I just acknowledge that I, this makes me, so we stay with that acknowledgement for a minute. You acknowledge it and you say, hi, fear. Hi, I'm, I have fear of COVID. I don't know. I've never had fear of COVID, so I'm, but in like, you know, anything that you have fear. And you acknowledge it and then you create the space. And you create the space. You don't fight fear by ignoring fear. You don't fight fear by being by rejecting it and saying, I'm not gonna feel this way because I'm like amazing and I shouldn't, have it, I shouldn't have fear and this is inadequate. The only way to fight fear and anxiety is by being aware of it, by being in the present moment with it, by feeling it in your body, and then by basically let it flow and accept it and acknowledge. It's like a child. If a child is crying, the worst thing you can do is like ignore them and tell them, don't cry, I'm gonna hit you if you keep crying. Like they will cry more and more. It's just like, doesn't work, it fits, you know, fits it. So you, have, you, you, you fight fear by giving it space. And so that's something that you have to do over and over. It means like 10 times a day, that's what you do. You go and you, and you, you basically deal with it. Okay, we're gonna go to the next topic, one of my favorite topics, and I'm gonna ask you, I'm gonna ask brave people here, and may, we have a volunteer that will help me from the public. I think there's, a there's a, someone from the conference, my assistant. Um, <laughs> hey, so I want, I would love people to name their limiting beliefs. Anyone that is brave to say what, do you, you guys know what is a limiting belief because let's start with the premise. Whatever you believe will be. If it's positive, it will be. And if it's negative, it also will be. So, but limiting beliefs, for example, I'm going to give you an example so you understand what is a limiting belief. Of course, you know them, but when I started my first company, um, I, uh, you know, I had grown up in Chile. Uh, my generation was the first generation. I'm like the Hillary Clinton generation in the US, like equivalent in Chile. My generation was the first generation of women to really go in mass to the workforce and become professionals. So I didn't have a ton of role models and particularly not of entrepreneurs. So I didn't think that as a woman, I could, like, I could create a company, but I couldn't scale it and grow it. It's just not something I could do. So I want to hear any limiting beliefs that you might have. I want to hear anyone that is brave enough to share it. Anyone? Anyone wants to share a limiting belief? Don't, yeah, here we have, oh, then please, there's two gentlemen here brave enough, and I love that men are sharing their limiting beliefs. Sometimes men is like, no, I'm, I'm I have no limiting beliefs. I'm like, and that's absolutely not true, right? I mean, we all have them. I don't have enough time to go to the gym. Ah, good one, good one. Okay, excellent one. Anyone else wants to share a limiting belief? Here's a gentleman that wants to hear. Probably, you know, similar to the gym one, um, just that uh, limiting belief for me is that I'm not gonna be successful while I'm overweight. Right, okay. 
Anyone else wants to share? We're like open, open in here to limiting beliefs. So limiting beliefs are like fears in the sense that in order to fight them, you have to acknowledge them. But I would say with fear and anxiety, it's more instantaneous to kind of like to disarm them because with a simple scan of the, of the body and with a simple acknowledgement, they can be disarmed really fast. I mean, sometimes you need medicine too and go into a psychiatrist, but like in general, like you can. With limiting beliefs, it takes a while. So it's not just, just acknowledging it's huge and the first step, but limiting beliefs are so ingrained with what you grew up, the things that the experiences you have in the past, maybe you tried to lose weight before it didn't work. Maybe you tried to go to the gym and I don't know, like ended up that you never like found time or whatever, right? I mean, or whatever it was, was is that causes the limiting belief. But with limiting beliefs, it's the same. You have to acknowledge it. And then you start taking little actions, little steps, little goals that are not like huge goals. So in your case, I would never say, my goal should go to the gym every day for an hour and a half. No, but you start with like, hmm, what, in what direction can I start like attacking this limiting belief? And maybe this is just I go for a walk. I mean, whatever it is, but I think the limiting beliefs are things that like have to be attacked. Sometimes it takes for a very, very long time and not attacked. You have to become friends with it, have to like kind of disarm it, disarm it in a different way. And then eventually they go to your back. They are left in the past. And you realize that there were all things. I mean, you know it. You know that these are limiting beliefs that are not real. I knew when I was saying I cannot scale a company because I'm a woman was like stupid. And I knew it was a limiting belief. That doesn't mean I knew how to resolve it because it was so, so ingrained in me because I have not seen role models and I haven't seen this and I, I just couldn't imagine it, you know? And so I think... Um, it's a, it's a lot of work, but I think it's very refreshing. I'm going to give an, another example of my lim a recent limiting belief. Uh, I am now I'm raising money, and I think I'm going to be almost done with my round for my new company. That was a huge accomplishment for me because I had raised money from angel investors before. I never have raised money from venture capital, and I thought I didn't have what it takes, you know? And as I said, and, but I did put myself the last two years through an MBA program because I knew that I had these limiting beliefs about me, about my ability to talk about financial t statements. And I did try to do something about it. One of the things was empower myself by going to an, a, a business school. I hated going to business school. I mean, believe me, I didn't like it. I liked it more than law school, but, I, but, but you sometimes do things you have to do, right? But, but at the end of the day, I knew that it was important for me to feel this, this empowerment, this feeling that like, no matter what, I can take the risk, no matter what I can accomplish, and it makes me feel so, so much better. And now when I talk to investors, it's not like I master the spreadsheet, like that's not, that's not it, but at least I, I, in, my, in my mind, I have been there. I sat there and I have discussed it and I heard it in class and I did the exercise, so I feel much more confident because I have put myself in that position, right? So limiting beliefs, something to work on. And another huge one, another huge one that I think is so, um, so big is shifting from victim to owner. Who, who, wants to, uh, who wants to offer any perspective about what I'm saying here? What the, do you guys know what I'm saying? Anyone wants to like comment? What is a victim? What is an owner? And what am I talking about before I explain it? Please, the, the lady here. For me, what it makes me think of is that um, in every situation, even when it's not going well for me, oftentimes I try to think about what I'm doing to contribute to that situation. Like if my mom and I are arguing, that's something that happens a lot. Um, and she's just not hearing me and, and I get frustrated, I try to think about, well, why isn't she listening? What about what I'm saying doesn't resonate with her? 
that's amazing. That's exactly, that's one of the things. He says, how, what can I do about the situation? He's like, ah, it's, you could have said, uh, she doesn't care about me. That's it, that's the end. She doesn't care about me. Oh, well, poor me. That's a victim. It's like things happen to you. Basically, you are, um, I blame her. She doesn't care about me. And you, and we all go into it. That's the other thing I wanted to say. No one is always an owner. And like, you know, even us, I feel like I'm an owner, but I'm very much, a lot of times I do victim talk too as well. I mean, a lot, you know, it happens, you're not perfect. But the, the thing is, the idea is to shift more from the vic that victim to owner. So the victim would have said, yeah, she doesn't care about me. The owner that you have in you said, well, that's how I feel. She doesn't care about me. But what am I doing? And what, how am I contributing to the fact that she, has, that she seems not to care about me? What did I contribute to that? And maybe <laughs> there's nothing you can do. But at the end of the day, you're still like trying to figure out. And at the end of the day, the owner is the one that actually is just happy, even if she hasn't, you know, whatever. You know, you're going to be happy. You're going to be happy no matter what. You're not going to be dependent on her love or on her like changing for you to be happy. I said the owner will take that being, being into, into her life. So anyone else wants to offer any other perspective about who is a victim and who is an owner, maybe in the context of work? Being a, an owner gives you power. Being a victim keeps you stuck, right? So thinking about, you said work. Uh, and leveling, right? Um, maybe you don't like where you're at or the position you're in or something like that. But if you find out what works, like what you can change, right? And look for the, the problems that you can make a difference with and people will notice that. And then you're, you, you can move on and you're not stuck there, right? If you feel like, oh, uh, like they don't, they don't like me or, or I, I can't, so it's someone else's fault that I'm not moving up, then, then you're stuck there. And what can you do about that? Right? You have no power to, to get out of that situation. So then. you just touched on something so, so important, which is the owners are all about what can I do. So bingo is all about what can, what can I do. And a, a, a victim is all about who can I blame? My boss, I'll blame my boss, I'll blame the system, I'll blame this. I mean, the system, sorry, sucks sometimes. So like, let's blame the system. <laughs> sometimes we have to blame the system. But you know, like, what can I do? So the system sucks, what can I do? You know, in my case, you know, started something to help, you know, and that was my solution. But I'm saying we entrepreneurs do that or, but that's the thing. Um, and there's, and also like, as you were, as we were talking, like an owner, has, needs no reason to be happy, is happy. An owner is about basically taking full responsibility for what happens in life and the reaction to life. And that's, that's kind of super empowering. Have you noticed something in life or have, have you had this experience where something really challenging is going on, like super bad, like really bad, and you're like, wow, this is so interesting. This is showing me what I, you know, how I, that this is trying to teach me this. Like, you can make something really bad, an experience that is really bad into an amazing learning experience. And that's really getting to play with life. And that playfulness with life and that inquiry, you know, is just going to make you, makes you an owner and not a victim. That, that's all it is. It's all about mindset. It's called the abandoned mindset. And... I would, I would like to, to move to my, almost my last slide of, of like terming in terms of, um, before I, I'll open for Q and A, but I want to talk a little bit about using affirmations and living visions. Anyone is familiar with affirmations? Anyone uses affirmations here? Just raise your hand. You, you, anyone wants to share? You don't have to, if we don't need the, the microphone, but like, can you share an affirmation that you use? Yeah? Or whoever said they were using affirmations? I, I don't see her. Which one? I choose Joyce. Oh, that's great. So uh, that's a one. The affirmations are I, 
I, they use the word I, and they're in the present tense, and they have something to do with emotion. So I choose joy. When do you use this affirmation? <laughs> Every day? I should get that up. Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> Who else uses affirmations? Want to share it? Awesome. You can say, I add value. Instead of changing, I can, I add value. Who else wants to share a, a, an affirmation that they're using? Please. Um, yeah, so mine is based off of a concept in skiing. I, I always tell myself, find your line. Because you? when you're skiing and you're going through like a, a glade run with a lot of trees, if you focus on the obstacles and the trees, you're going to only see the trees and you're going to run straight into them. So we say, find your line, find the line through the trees, find the path forward out of the difficult situation. So That's I try to tell myself awesome. that every day. What a powerful affirmation. So th those affirmations, I, I am, to be honest, I'm learning how to use affirmations. I, 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 I use them before a, an important meeting sometimes. I try, but it's hard. But what I've been using though, and these affirmations are great. So they're in the present tense. They're about things that you like, not something you don't want. So you wouldn't say like affirmation. I don't, I don't want to be fired. I don't want to be, no, no don't do that. <laughs> like, just focus on something positive. I, I will do great today at my work. I will succeed at, you know, I will be promoted, whatever it is, right? It's in present tense, uh, it's what you want. Uh, keep it brief, um, it has to have with emotions, it has to feel calm, and it's about you and not others. It's not about like, I want him to like, stop harassing me, you know? Like that's not gonna work. It has to be about everything about you. And let's talk a little bit about living vision. So living vision is something I 100% recommend. And it's something that you can change a lot. But the living vision is a, it's like basically something that you will write in one page. You know, if you have time to do it today when you go back to your hotel or whatever, it's one page where you write, what is your ideal day? I wake up and I just, and I go for a walk and then I go, for, then I meet people for breakfast. I mean, this is all invented because I never have time, but it doesn't matter. Like all the things that, that your ideal day would be like, and, and, and I go to work and I change the world and work in these amazing projects and you're very specific. And I work with creative people, people and designers and, you know, and, and I, I live, I'm living in Paris or whatever it is that you want to, but imagine it like, and this, they're all in the present tense and they're all something that you, start, you feel it would be like, that would be ideal, you know, maybe do it after you went to exercise or you get out of the shower because you have to be inspired to write your living vision. And that living vision, you write it and you're like, and then you, you don't realize things start happening to you. Like, because, I don't know, you, because what happens is when you write these things, like they're a little bit out of the box and they're a little bit like whatever, but I'll write it, you know? you then start to like open up to things like that, that you were probably close because they you not, did not think they were in your radar or they were, you deserve them or they were for you. So you'll be like, nah. Like you would like find interesting people in a forum and you're like, no, they would not think. No, because you said that you wanted to be surrounded by these people, so you're not gonna go and get surrounded by these people, right? So living visions are powerful, coupled with affirmations. I 100% recommend doing that. And we have to wrap it up, but I, I want to tell a little bit, um, you, can, you can find me on LinkedIn. My name is Andrea Gwendelman. Like connect with me, ask me any questions about spirituality, uh, any questions about my work, any questions about just like connect to say hi. Um, I would love to, be, to, to connect with all of you. And I want to give a little bit, and, and, I think there were a couple of other things that I, that I had, but I think we, 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 they're all part of this work. That once you're like connected inside, you can access intuition. You can make decisions with intuition, more intuitively, they're, you, they're effortless. And then you can manage with compassion because you know yourself, because you're more calm, because you're not threatened, right? You can interact with others from that place of being, that place of calmness, that place of patience, right? And so, 
makes you more attractive. And furthering your growth, I think this is the, the invitation. I want to ask you to, to, to basically go and continue your growth. This is a journey that, that is for life. And it's so rewarding, though, because like, you control your own happiness. I mean, who, who doesn't want to control their own happiness? And I left some benefits that you can even ask your employers to get you some benefits or mental health things or anything that has to do with, with uh, mindfulness, because these are really important things um, for work. I mean, they create better team relationships. You become a better leader. You become more happy and more productive at work. You create, become more creative. All these are key things. Are you ever exhausted and you're at the capability? Are you only about work, work, and run to the ground? I, you, you're not going to be useful to anyone, right? I mean, absolutely you're not. So while we work hard, we also work hard at cultivating these skills because this is what will will give us happiness, pleasure, and people will want to be with us and surrounded by us. So thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed, and um, it was a pleasure to meet you.